And now we invite our keynote speaker. Dan Ellsberg is perhaps best known as the whistleblower who released the Pentagon Papers. He's been an analyst at RAND Corporation, a consultant to the Defense Department specializing in problems of command and control of nuclear weapons, war plans, and crisis decision making. Dan recently released his critically acclaimed memoir, America's Doomsday Machine, Conf Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. Please welcome Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you very much. It's wonderful, despite the occasion, it's wonderful to be back in my family here, our family reunion. I don't think of myself as a very religious person, but some years ago, as I approached a civil disobedience action, I realized everyone needs community. Religion provides rituals that bind communities. I realized that I had a religion Nonviolent resistance to wrongdoing, to nuclear war, to wrongful interventions. And that, that religion had rituals that bound my community together, getting arrested, civil disobedience, <laughs> nonviolent actions. So we are having, from my point of view, a ritual today, and thank you for taking part of it in it with me. It's wonderful to see some specific old friends who have been at this for me, with me for a long time. 1982, Louis Vitale here, who led the first action in more than 20 years onto the nuclear test site near Nevada. He got arrested there. Stop the testing. <laughs> All right, we stopped the testing, he says that, as Louis says. And uh, my friend Evan Fryrish, who is here, uh, who got arrested with me on Nagas and many others on Nagasaki Day. Or couple of days from now, 50 years ago, 1978. Now, from one point of view, of course, it's wonderful. We're all together again after all this. And the other point of view, we have to say it hasn't changed. We haven't stopped it. It's still going on. From the other point of view, the bomb hasn't exploded on people during that time. And I think that people like this here and others were absolutely critical to that moratorium. Uh, that's lasted now 73 years since 1945. I want to talk today about the concept of time and uh, time enough and too late. A year before he died on the day, uh, a year before he died, April 4th, Martin Luther, uh, 1967, Martin Luther King said about the Vietnam War, and he ended the speech, by the way, talking about nuclear weapons. There is such a thing as too late. That concept is very much with us now in connection with the climate catastrophe. These environmental scientists talk about the possible tipping point. Uh, and even before that, aware it's absolutely too late to change things. And even before that, uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that would be uh, so much that catastrophic flooding and droughts and climate problems and so forth would be unavoidable no matter what we did after that. It's not quite clear when either of those points is to be reached. Probably in the New York Times uh, today, uh, giving a whole section to an article on climate, climate catastrophe, the way that the New Yorker gave a whole section on August of uh, 1945 to John Hersey's Hiroshima starts in the first paragraph as I read it my wife made me look at it while before while a car was waiting for me to come here if I read it correctly it says it really is too late now to to avoid quite catastrophic disastrous change here in the way of water level rise and other not too late to avoid still more catastrophic change if we change quickly, which we have not done, and under this administration show no signs of doing. I often think of the, uh, and then the, the quote of the tipping point, where things really get out of control, and we don't know exactly where that is. Have we passed it? We don't really know. 
I'm going to say it again, but I'll say it now. I call on all of us to act as if we still have time to change this. We don't know otherwise. It's impossible to say that it's too late at any given point. And to show what that means, uh, I often think of the experience of the Titanic. Was it too late for the Titanic to survive when it set out from Southampton, was it? Hardly. In fact, at that point, the uh, captain of the ship had given an interview recently that a modern ship could not go down. No, it, uh, they didn't even think it was possible. It was impossible. Some people thought that it would go down. That was wrong, obviously. Um, days into the voyage, on the day, this last day on the voyage, uh, they got six warnings of ice ahead. Almost every other ship in the vicinity, and there were many of them, heeded those warnings by going further south, away from a greater concentration of ice than had ever been seen in April before. So they went south to miss that. Uh, others, later in the day, uh, in the face of the ice warnings, actually stopped dead in their tracks and some went very slowly ahead, so they'd be sure to see them. The Titanic on its maiden voyage did none of those, because Bruce Ismay, the owner of the line who was on the ship for the maiden voyage, was determined not just to make the schedule, but to break the schedule, to get to New York ahead of time, and thus advertised that this was not only the most luxurious and largest ship of its time ever, but the fastest. Something, by the way, it had not advertised, had not sold it on that point. But it was going to surprise people that it was fastest. And that made it, uh, uh, it contradicted the idea of going south, which would have slowed, slowed the course, or slowing course, let alone stopping. So it went ahead after getting, at the time that it was getting a uh, final signal that there was an iceberg straight ahead, the ship had one minute at that point, but it was going at full speed. Two knots short of full speed, actually. The only ship in the ocean that night that was moving ahead toward that ice with full speed, thanks to the influence on the presence of the owner, uh, Bruce Ismay. They still had a minute, and interestingly, that would have been enough time to miss the iceberg. It's never been fully explained where the first 30 seconds or so of that minute uh, were spent uh, not spent in uh, turning away from the iceberg. Uh, in fact, one story I, I just read, rereading it, was that the uh, helmsman had turned the, hand, the uh, course the wrong way at first and had to correct it. Another one, that at some point they didn't change course beyond what they had in thinking that they were going to avoid it. But physically, engineering terms, they could have avoided it at that point. If they had gone straight ahead into the iceberg, a couple of compartments would have flooded, but the ship would not have sunk. It took five compartments flooding for the ship to sink. It would have crushed those first two compartments had they not swerved, and not quite fast enough, to miss the ship, uh, miss the iceberg. So it did have a chance there. Actually, I just read uh, another ship, a large ship, almost as large, had rammed right into an iceberg uh, just once before and had survived. What it did then was to try to turn, scraped the uh, iceberg, and because of low quality rivets and low quality steel to save money uh, that they had on the thing, pressing it, buckled the iceberg and opened five compartments. Four could survive. With five, it was now going down. So one minute after seeing the iceberg, one minute after, it was too late and nothing they could do then would keep that ship from going down. But up till that point, a first uh, engineer, a, uh, or the second command on the ship, who had heard the ice warnings, could have said, ignore Ismay's interests here, you must move south, you must slow, you must stop, you must do what all the other ships did, do not go straight ahead at full speed into that ice. And had they in effect mutinied, or used uh, ultimate uh, authority there to, to uh, contradict the, the word capitalist has been used here, but the, the capitalist uh, uh, interests that kept it going, the ship would have survived. And the thousand people who went down with it when it went down uh, would have survived. 
the people who jumped into the water all, all died within uh, minutes from hypothermia, and the uh, people in the uh, lifeboats filled only half, uh, many of the lifeboats were only half full because they hadn't practiced it enough, thinking there was no danger and not worrying about it. And there weren't enough lifeboats on the ship for everybody on the assumption that the ship would, if anything happened of a problem, they would have plenty of time to move everyone back and forth between an, them and another ship. So all these choices had been made over a period of time not to have enough lifeboats in order, by the way, to create space for the first class passengers to have patios to look on, to sell them at very high rates for the first class passengers instead of having lifeboats on those spaces. So all these decisions had been made one after another over a period of years in designing this. And finally, as I say, it was not really too late until the ship had hit the iceberg. Have we hit the iceberg on climate? No one knows. No scientist purports to be able to say whether or not it is, in fact, too late at this point. On August 9th, a plane went over toward Kokura, Japan, as its first target. Hiroshima had been hit on the 6th. Its secondary target was Nagasaki. Secondary, by the way, because Nagasaki had not been on the list of, like uh, Kokura and Hiroshima and Niigata, of cities not to be firebombed so that they would show potentially the full effects of the mass murder to be committed on them, of the fire. Nagasaki was not on that list because it had been bombed only days earlier. There was already, uh, there was already damage on it, so you couldn't entirely uh, show just how dangerous the, war the bomb was. But it was secondary target. They headed for Kokura, and to be sure that they got the maximum number of people killed, the bomb was to be dropped only on visual sighting. They didn't want to drop it off, uh, off center, off ground zero, where they wanted. So they were ordered not to do it. And had they, uh, for some reason, because of clouds over the target, had to go back with the bomb, they would have to drop it in the sea, lose that one of the two weapons we had, uh, rather than try to land with it. Uh, in uh, either Iwo Jima or Okinawa. So they go to Kokura and find that because of a huge air raid on Yamata just nearby the day before, there was a lot of bomb smoke and fire smoke over Kokura, and they went back and forth three times over the city, which was doomed uh, otherwise, and couldn't see through the smoke. So they turned to Nagasaki, which is second part so it was not too late for Kokura, actually, when that plane took off. Kokura survived the war, as a matter of fact. Having not been bombed, it was on the list that had not been bombed. They went to, to Nagasaki, and there, uh, 49 seconds after the bomb was dropped, uh, Nagasaki was destroyed. But come back now to three days earlier. Hiroshima was the first target had not been bombed, in part had chosen, by the way, because it had no serious military bases or industry, had some military, but not enough to put it on a priority for bombing earlier. So it would show, it would show the effects of the bomb. Plane arrives over the target at about 8.14, 8.15, and they do see they didn't have enough clouds. They could see the aiming point, actually, in the center of Hiroshima, not the military base or the factories in the suburbs. So they were clear to drop the bomb. Nearly every history that you'll see, and I looked up this up on uh, Hiroshima today, uh, on Wikipedia today, says that the bomb was dropped at eight, and exploded, actually, at 8.15. The bomb exploded at 8.15. The bomb was dropped by parachute so as to save the life of the crew in the plane, that they would not be destroyed by the blast themselves, give them a chance to move away this way, a special maneuver for bombs. Later, with tactical bombs that 
where, uh, where the bomber was closer to the, bo uh, the uh, show, uh, ground, they practiced in what they uh, called a high altitude bomb. The pilot would come in like this and then loft the bomb this way, and the pilot does what used to call an Immelman turn, move away this way as the bomb is going there, so as to get away from it in fast. The same motive, by the way, that uh, is at the basis of what you heard just a little bit earlier, the long-range standoff uh, missile, which is intended, like an air-launched cruise missile, to allow the pilots to escape from the devastation they're causing on the ground with their bomb. Uh, and they do it by staying and from air defense. So they stay outside the circle of air defense and they send the missile in on a long-range standoff. The idea being, you know, no, no effort is spared to uh, make it sure that the bomber can get away, come back home to something. That's the idea. And uh, Louis here is not in, he was in Strategic Air Command, right? Uh, as was uh, Norman, the one we heard earlier. And I might say, I was very pleased that a SAC crewman had read uh, my book, The Doomsday Machine, because a dream of mine is that it would be read by people in the Strategic Air Command, or now the Strategic Command, and in the Pentagon, and that I might evoke a series of Me Too responses. Of, yes, yes, I know that, that's true, I went through that. I would love to get that, I haven't, haven't gotten it yet. So, the bomb man at Hiroshima was dropped by parachute, three parachutes actually, to slow its descent and give the bomber the time to get away. And of course, as you've probably already heard, uh, people on the ground at Hiroshima did not even have an air alert because the approach of one or two or three bombers, a couple observer bombers, was not thought to be an air raid, it was thought to be reconnaissance. So uh, they didn't expect uh, danger from a single, from one, two, or three bombers. In Nagasaki, an air alarm three days later was sounded. And then the all clear was sounded, having decided that it was only one, several planes, they had a couple of other things, no problem. So people are out on the streets um, at around 8.15, uh, going to school, finishing their breakfast, on the way to work, having just gotten to work, uh, slightly, and not really fearing anything. From the example of Kokora, three days later, we can say that at 8.14, it was not quite too late for Hiroshima. If there had been enough smoke over Hiroshima, the bombers could have veered away and doomed some other city. So uh, their fate was not sealed at that point. But for a period before the bomb exploded, it was too late. That corresponded, uh, even though people didn't know it, nothing they could have done would have changed anything at that point. Uh, it was like the point when the iceberg actually buckled to the plates on the Titanic for five of the compartments after which it was too late. It took 53 seconds for the bomb to drop. So the time uh, schedule of 8.15 is correct for the dropping of the bomb, but not for the explosion, which took place at 8.15.53. And during that part, then, I'm saying, history was divided into three parts around that time. And I'll come back to that a little. But, of course, as of 53 seconds later, the part we're living in now, the part where a city can be wiped out by one bomb, had begun 73 years ago. How many people here are older than 73? Interesting. Okay, so you all, like me, I'm 87, live for some years, I live for 14 years, in a world in which it was not possible for a city to disappear in a flash. It was not possible for, uh, for a city to have the experience that people in Pakistan and elsewhere have now with respect to drones. That suddenly, from a source that they haven't even seen or can't even see, a flash comes and their house is wiped out. 
and everyone in Pakistan lives with that now. In Hawaii, I was just with last week a couple, uh, Cynthia uh, Lazaroff. Okay, I have, I need about two minutes and, or three minutes. I've used my time up, but I'm gonna use about three minutes more. But I, I will say, who were in Hawaii for the, uh, for the uh, alert that just happened, and who believed for some 38 minutes that their world was about to disappear. In other words, they experienced what all humans on Earth have lived with for 60 to 70 years since then. <laughs> I lived at 87 for 14 years uh, in a world where no one had, con for some years actually, the first two years of my life, in a world where no one had conceived of nuclear fission. That was that world. Okay, we can go through various other periods that we all represent here. But I, my time is over, I'll focus just on Hiroshima. There were not two periods, there was a moment when the, well, our history, as I say, was divided into three parts. The Before the bomb was dropped, after the bomb exploded, which is us ever since then, and 53 seconds, when life was going on absolutely as before, people were not diving into air raid shelters, they were living their life, and they were looking around and they were doing anything that they often did at 8.15, walking to school, walking past gardens, lying in bed with their wife or their husband at that point. And that period, when in fact it was too late, but they didn't know it, was, and couldn't, couldn't know it, was somewhat longer than people realize. It doesn't sound long. So I'm gonna ask you to do, uh, just take a minute here, a little less than a minute. I'm gonna ask you to do what I've asked a couple times before because it's a very interesting experience. I'm gonna ask you to shut your eyes in a few seconds and imagine that you're in Japan eating breakfast, lying with your spouse, walking to school, seeing flowers now. Close your eyes if you would. And I'll tell you when 53 seconds have passed. Now, longer than you thought, wasn't it? So had you been in Hiroshima in a forest like this, you would have seen the green trees during that period, could have picked a flower. A child could have been conceived in that period pretty easily, might even have survived. A lot of life goes on, meaning what I draw from it, every minute we have here is precious. Everything is at stake. We don't know if it's too late to keep those trees from dying in a nuclear winter within a year of an explosion, whether it's too late. We don't know that it is. And that means we each of us have the opportunity as living humans to do what we can to postpone that, to avert it, to make it less likely forever. And that is worth doing. And as a matter of fact, I don't think that it is very likely, as things are going, that we will have another 73 years without the full-scale nuclear war. I think it's unlikely. But it's not impossible. No one can prove that it's too late to postpone that or avert it. And no price, no individual price, is too high to pay to avert that. In the way of whistleblowing, in the way of resistance, what we're doing now, in the way of urging people in Livermore and in the, in the White House and everything else, to do what could have been done on the Titanic uh, for hours, 
after the warnings have been received, and that is demand a change in course, which is what we need. Thank you.